Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. It is a rainy, rainy, dark January Thursday, uh, and it's a great pleasure that you can take this time to be with me this afternoon for a half hour while we delve into the wonders of the ancient world, and particularly in response to your fantastic questions. So, without further ado, we must get on as some of the questions that came in live from last time when we last had a chance to speak when I was up at Lytham St Anne's about to give my presidential lecture and I was joined by the chair of the Lytham St Anne's Classical Association Committee, Katrina Kelly. Uh, one of the questions that came in we didn't have a chance to respond to you about came in from Rajru Padas, who was talking about incense and we were speaking a little bit about incense in the ancient world and how it was used particularly within uh, the context of Roman everyday life and in particular in festivals and Rodrigo question was about where does that incense come from in antiquity um, and the answer Rajup, is exactly the same you talked about the fact that you knew the Arabs were still using uh, kind of tree wood native to India and they were bringing that across the Indian Ocean well exactly the same was happening for the Romans and lots of their incense and lots of the products they used to make incense uh, became available into the Roman Empire really as part of the big expansion of the Roman trading network in the first century AD when the Romans learned and how to uh, actually sail with the monsoon winds right across the Indian Ocean and thus could access all the fantastic trading markets of India. Before that, they were purchasing uh, the uh, incense materials that were available through their trading networks with Arabia. Uh, so you see a change in development in the different kinds of incense that are available within the Roman world over time as their trade networks expand. So thank you for that. And Peter Voller came in. Which figure of ancient Greece or Rome do you think has had the most long-lasting effect on history? I think this is a really interesting question. What's had, who, which figure has had the most long-lasting effect on history? Long, that's a really tough question to answer. And I think there's lots of names that still come to our minds. You know, we might think about Alexander the Great, we might think about Pericles in the Greek world, uh, we might think about the Roman Emperor Augustus or Julius Caesar. These are the names from the Roman ancient world that trip off our tongue. But does that mean that they had the most long-lasting effect? Well, people like Augustus Julius Caesar had months named after them that we still use in our calendar. Obviously, from the Roman perspective, we still have bits of their world around us and lots of uh, ways in which uh, our world, particularly in the Western and the Mediterranean, works still works along those lines, whether it's the road, like the Fossway, not far from uh, me here at Warwick, uh, etc., all the way through to, as the Monty Python sketch goes, uh, apart from the aqueducts, the water, the education, and everything else that they gave us. What have the Romans ever done for us? So I guess it would have to be a Roman, I think, that's had the most long-lasting effect on us. Uh, in terms of the physical structures around us, in terms of the frames in which we organise our lives. But on the other hand, imagine the Greeks and we could say, not an individual, but a collective of people, say the Athenians, inventing democracy in 508 BC, were themselves creating something which has had an incredibly long-lasting effect on us. So... Peter, I don't know. I don't know how to answer your question. I don't think there's one I can absolutely pick, but I'd be absolutely fascinated to hear uh, your thoughts as well um, as to what you think has had the most, or who do you think, or uh, what community or group of people do you think have had uh, the most long-lasting effect on us? Um, and that would be fantastic, fantastic to hear. Now, I'm having some comments. No sound problems here, says John. Hello there, says Debbie. But people in Italy have got zero sound Problem sound is fine here for Hugh. Uh, Homer, Sarah, you're suggesting Plato. Uh, Lorraine, you can't hear anything either. Oh my Lord, okay, what's happening? Um, hopefully uh, people can uh, can hear me sometime soon and I'm not just talking, I'm just looking like I'm talking to an empty screen. Uh, it's probably because of Brexit, Sarah says. Yes, this is in fact the last time that I will be talking to you while Britain is still a full uh, member of the European Union. And after this, we will be having our live Q&A Brexit podcast. Um, hopefully, uh, at, least, at least this aspect of our lives won't be affected um, by the break that is to come on Friday. And we can continue to be an open and global community of people uh, who are interested in the ancient world coming together. Um, so uh, thank you, Peter, for your question. We've had suggestions of Plato. We've had suggestions of Homer. Uh, Linda's talking about Bacchus has had an effect on many. Hit, yes. <laughs> so the person who invented the what? Well, I guess it's not a Greek or Roman 
individual that we can uh, make responsible for winemaking, obviously, um, as winemaking was around long before uh, the Greeks and the Romans. But uh, kind of in terms of the figure of Bacchus uh, or Dionysus, of course, absolutely. Thank you for tuning in from Sweden. Fine is sound is fine with you, Richard. So it just it sounds like it might just be Italy that's having trouble. Um, Hugh, thank you. You've been having fun watching This Is Greece on PBS the last few days. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It was a great fun series to film. And as a number of people have commented, it's sort of falls into two kinds of structures in that the programme was filmed uh, and parts of the programme were filmed, particularly with the narrator uh, uh, previously. And then I came on board to do sections of kind of live commentary and presenting while we were going around Greece for the different locations. Uh, but it was fascinating for me to see some of the locations as well um, and to get in there and, and get stuck into some of the lesser known parts of Greece and particularly have some fun travelling across the islands. Um, so that was a, a great, great trip to do. Um, and the programme originally was made for SBS in Australia. Uh, so it originally went for an Australian audience and then has been come over to PBS in America and then also um, on uh, uh, Sky uh, and Freeview as well. Augustus says, Patricia, absolutely. I would have to agree. I think Augustus would be a major figure um, that I would put in also. So thank you very much. Still no audio for Joe Matthew Reaver. My God, it really is an Italy problem. I fingers crossed that we might be able to sort something uh, very soon. Uh, but I don't think it's anything coming from my side. Uh, so fingers crossed that you can work out what the technical gremlins uh, might be in there. Well, I hope everyone is well. I hope everyone has had a fantastic week. Um, we've had a great question in from William Robson, age nine, talking about Horrible Histories. Now, you may remember over the summer, the Horrible Histories, the movie, came out and I was recommending everyone to go to see it. And William's talking about his favourite Horrible Histories song, which is Unminted. Uh, which for some reason in my head I want to sort of sing it uh, like the kind of Marway song like I'm minted, I'm minted, you're welcome, you're welcome. Um, but that I'm minted song is uh, I, I will stop singing there, everyone. I know, I know, I know. I was told age nine to stop singing because I was putting the rest of the group off tune, um, and it was quite a large group of people who were singing as well. So so I'm aware that my singing voice leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, uh, but the I'm minted song uh, is a, talking about Marcus Licinius Crassus who was was famously, supposedly, the richest man in Rome. John Matthew, we're losing you. You're going to try and have a look at it when it's uploaded to YouTube. Farewell, everyone. Farewell. I'm so sorry the technical gremlins have got in the way. It really is, isn't it, a symbol of Brexit, uh, of Brexit Day upcoming. Um, I'm glad that none of you have come to this uh, podcast, uh, this, this live Q&A, and, and I certainly am not with little flags uh, waving, um, but it is very nice to know that at least in Brussels they will be leaving a light on. Um, so we're talking about horrible history songs. Uh, Marcus Licinus Crassus, I'm minted. So you may know this song and uh, I've been warned that once you listen to it, it kind of gets into your head and you can't stop singing it in the car as you go along. And I'm minted, I'm minted. Right, okay, I'm stopping that. Uh, now, uh, William's question was about exactly how minted was Crassus. Uh, now, this is this guy, he was supposedly the richest man in Rome. He was part of the triumvirate alongside Caesar and Pompey, who sort of ruled Rome at the very end of the era of the Republic before it then sort of morphed through the civil wars into the beginning of the Roman Empire. He was the sort of the glue, if you like, because Caesar and Pompey were the really e were the big egos. Um, Caesar and Crassus were were good friends and good allies, but um, Pompey and Crassus didn't get on so well. But actually, it was really once Crassus was out of the picture, he died in battle, uh, that Caesar and Pompey's relationship really went downhill, and that sort of sped apart into full on um, civil war. Now, uh, Crassus had sort of had a career first rebuilding his family fortunes. His family had lost a lot of money so it wasn't that he was just wealthy well he was wealthy but he wasn't amazingly wealthy from the beginning um he actually uh, kind of made a lot of money and then after that he went on to have a very significant uh, political career using that money um and then he was made as part of the triumvirate he was made governor of syria and that's when things started to go wrong because he decided to launch a full-out assault against the persian empire the enemies of rome to the east um and actually ended up uh, kind of losing an enormous battle the battle of Karai um, in about 53 BC, which was in fact also, interestingly, the first time that we think the Romans ever saw silk. 
uh, because the Persians had silk banners which they unfolded on the battlefield. And this apparition of this new diaphanous material that the Romans didn't know what to do with, it was said to have caused a sight and upset and really unnerved the Romans hugely as part of that great defeat that was inflicted on them and led to the death of Crassus. Um, so kind of how rich was he? Well, the, the estimates vary from the ancient sources about how big his wealth really was. Some say sort of 200 million sesterce, right? That's a lot of sesterce. Some do it in talents, the more kind of ancient Greek way of doing it, which is related to gold, so something over 7,000 talents. It's notoriously difficult to try and bring ancient money values into modern money values to give it some kind of comparison. Hello from India, you're okay. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in and hopefully you can hear everyone um, as well. Uh, Sarah's asking, why was silk so scary? Well, it was the fact it had never been seen before. It was as if the Persians had something that Rome didn't, right? And could that just be the tip of the iceberg? Was that the tip of uh, the iceberg in terms of new weaponry or some kind of new gods on their side that they could have this material that had never, ever been seen before? Imagine when you see something that you have have no relation to and didn't even know it could possibly exist and suddenly there the enemy are using it as part of their banners flying in the wind leading them in char into charge into battle um and uh, but if you try some people have tried to equate uh crassus's fortune and it'd probably be in the region of something like 11 billion dollars right so i mean it's a huge amount of money he really was very very wealthy now uh, william's other question is did that money bring power in ancient rome yes absolutely money was an incredible lever for power now uh, so was birth Right? If you came from a very wealthy, elite, aristocratic family or a family that had a very long and illustrious uh, lineage of heroic deeds and service to Rome, that was obviously also a very powerful and important um, uh, card you could play. But money really was very important because if you had money, you had the ability to do things. That meant that people would come as prospective clients. They would literally queue up outside your door in the morning. And an elite Roman was really judged, his influence by judge was judged by how many people were lining up outside his house uh, asking to um, asking for a favour to become one of, as a result, to become one of his clients. Uh, and as a result, that elite Roman had a pat, had patronage, had a patronage circle, a widespreading circle of people who would do his bidding. Uh, now, obviously, that could that client network could be heavily helped and expanded by wealth, um, as long as, uh, as well as in elections, if you wanted to stand for election, uh, that wealth could be put to good use in terms of electioneering and thus uh, uh, making sure people voted for you, um, as well as simply putting on massive public events, which would help convince the people of Rome that you were a really good guy, just as an emperor would do in the future um, through the bread and circuses, etc. So um, kind of really, really money did make a big difference and Crassus certainly made good use of it. Uh, and uh, William's final song uh, question is, do I, or does anyone else out there, have a favourable, horrible, favourite, horrible histories song, right? Um, well, let me know if you have a favourite horrible history song. So for me, it's probably the one from the Groovy Greeks, uh, where you've got all the philosophers going, uh, we're the thinkers, right? So kind of, it's very kind of Beach Boys-esque. It's like, hey, hey, we're the thinkers, wondering what the kind of life is all about. I kind of think, and again, I'm not going to sing any more. That's not, <laughs> uh, well, no, kind of not, not my forte. But yeah, do let us know um, about uh, what your favourite favorite Horrible Histories song is. A couple of questions are coming. Christina, is the Delphi Doc on Curious, uh, on Curious Stream a new one? Curious Stream? What is Curious Stream, uh, Christina? Please let me know. Uh, it's just a rename of, of De Belly Button Doc. Um, ooh, is I don't know. I do not know. Um, so I did the, the Delphi uh, doc called Belly Button of the Ancient World for BBC uh, Four back in ooh, back in 2010. I have done some other uh, material about Delphi for different programmes, but I don't know the documentary to which you are referring. Um, so please let us know more or do write in either to michaelscottacademic at gmail.com or direct to the Facebook page through Facebook Messenger and we'll uh, get an answer to you about that. Ian Nikas, how did you enjoy your recent visit to sunny Belfast? Well, it was a little while ago now. 
now actually that I got to, to sunny Belfast to come talk to the Classical Association of Northern Ireland. Um, and then I had a very, very brief stopover in Belfast Airport um, over the summer on my way back from Cairngorms National Park. Um, but actually one of the things I was going to mention in the classics in the news is about, um, and I'm trying to see if we've got it here. Uh, yeah, it's about the mummy in uh, Ulster Museum. So uh, the Egyptian mummy that's on display there in the Ulster Museum, who is named uh, Takabuti, right? They finally worked out after long, long, long periods of academic discussion as to what uh, killed this mummy, the, the poor person. And they think, it's absolutely brilliant, they think they died through a stab in the back. They were stabbed in the back. Fabulous, fabulous, the kind of intrigue, intrigue um, that we like to, to see. I'm, remarried, um, I'm, I'm reminded of the great Carry On Cleo uh, line as Julius Caesar gets murdered, stabbed in the back. Infamy, infamy, they've all got it in for me. Uh, yes, so uh, Tavak Tutti apparently was stabbed in the back, but they're not quite sure now how Egyptian Takabuti actually might be um, because uh, according to the DNA tests, um, that they have revealed that she's genetically more similar to Europeans than modern Egyptians. Um, so here we go. Uh, kind of suddenly the question has become, where did Takabuti come from as much as anything? Alexis, the Boudicca song, the philosopher's song and my daughter's is um, is the Pachacuti song. Okay, might not be spelled. <laughs> right, well, I'm not sure either. Um, the Boudicca song is brilliant from the movie, absolutely fantastic. Ra Ra Cleopatra coming at you from Fiona, brilliant, I love this. I think what we should do here clearly is get together and have a group Horrible History sing-along, perhaps produce an album. I'm sure it would be an absolute uh, runaway sellout success um, with everyone could contribute a line or two from their favourite horrible history song and as a result we would have a sort of mashup of the ancient Greek and Roman worlds um, through the uh, filter of horrible history's uh, individual one-liners. How about it? If you're up for it, I am. Everyone can record their individual lines, send it in and we'll create a mashup mixtape. Yes, there's not enough mixtapes anymore in the world in my uh, considered opinion. Um, so let's make it a mixtape for good old um, uh, horrible history's sake. So William, thank you as ever for that brilliant, brilliant, brilliant questions. Julia Mescal, you've been asking about what writing materials did they use in ancient times? Was there a type of ink they used? Well, yes. Um, but also they were using a variety of different writing materials. So um, we have all the Vindolanda tablets in the Roman world, obviously, which are uh, the, the remains of wood uh, tablets that then would have had wax put on them and then the message inscribed into wax. You could write it in the wax and then you could just rub it out and kind of remix the wax and then you could write on it again. And the surviving tablets are coming through because they've scratched through to the wood underneath and we're reading that writing. So you could use the wax tablets. Um, there was papyrus, so people were writing on papyrus in ink as well. Um, but uh, some of the uh, kind of interesting, really interesting things, I think, are actually about invisible inks. Mm. So if someone asked you, were there any invisible inks in the ancient world? Well, yes, there were. And in fact, this was the topic of the first ever TV interview I did for a programme for the History Channel back in 2008, um, talking about invisible inks. Um, and what kind of invisible inks were they using? Well. Uh, the first was milk, right? So Ovid, in his love letters, and right, he's writing, he's got his writing either about to his, to his love, the kind of frustrated lover who is a woman who is married and so he can't be with her, but he loves her from afar. It's all very, very, very poetic and very frustrating, full of passion and sentiment. Uh, he works out a way to uh, write secret messages to her using milk. Uh, this is a great thing to do at home uh, with your kids if you're kind of they want you want some good safe easy experiments to do. So you get them some milk and uh, they get a paintbrush or they get a pencil and you dip it in the milk and you write in milk on a piece of paper and obviously it dries and you can't see it. But if you then get some charcoal dust, uh, so get a piece of charcoal off the fire or whatever it might be, crunch it up a little bit and let them spread it over the paper, uh, the stickiness of the milk, the charcoal dust gets attracted to and sticks to the milk. And then you dust off the bits that, that aren't stuck and you are left with a message that you can read in which the milk and charcoal dust have combined to bring out the letters. There you go. Ovid was doing this in, the, uh, in antiquity in the ancient world. We also know, slightly less good for an experiment with your kids at home, that uh, people, some people in the ancient world were using urine. Yes, indeed. So uh, you could uh, collect a sample 
uh, and you could write in urine and then when the paper dried the writing would disappear but then if you put that said paper over a heat source like a candle for instance the heat from the candle would make the writing stand out again and make it readable and uh, as we discovered as part of this uh, uh, History Channel documentary that we were doing, um, uh, urine, uh, and I'll leave this here, is not the only bodily fluid that one can use for uh, invisible ink writing that works in the same way. Anyway, we'll leave it at that. Uh, so, Julie Mesco, lots of different ways in which they could write in ancient times. Um, and if you are interested in the ways that the ancient Greeks could send secret messages, then I fully recommend that you read uh, a text from the 4th century BC um, thinking of the, about the Nis, the tactician, and uh, he's talking particularly about when a city is under siege, how do you get messages in and out? Uh, now, some of these message, secret message sending uh, techniques are slow. So one was you tattooed a message onto a slave's head, or having shaved his head, then you waited for his hair to grow back, and then you sent him into the besieged city because no one would suspect that he had a message tattooed on his head under his hair. And then the recipient shaved his head again to read the message. Now, this is definitively not a fast uh, method of message sending, but it did work uh, fairly well. The other one, which um, I, mm, yeah, I don't know if I would try this one at home, but, you know, hey, if you do, let us know and please do send in pictures. You... Um, Get a goat stomach or some other kind of animal stomach, washed preferably, um, and you blow it up uh, or fill it with water, get it as, 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 as big as possible, and then you write with an ink um, onto the goat stomach your particular message. Right? Once you've written on your message, you uh, take all the water or the air out of the goat stomach, deflate it, deflate it, deflate it, get a little flask, fill that with olive oil, and put the deflated goat stomach into the olive oil. Now, because of the colour of the olive oil and the deflated nature of the goat stomach, not only will the message not easily be read, but it'll be almost impossible to see that there's a goat stomach inside your olive oil flask at all. Uh, and then you just walk into the city with your uh, olive oil flask, and then on the other side, you take out said goat stomach and you reinflate it, and you will be able to read the message again. There you go. So now we know, uh, kind of, if you see, uh, and I apologise in advance if this sends uh, children at home uh, kind of in is a fun on a Saturday morning in your kitchen as a result is wrecked as, uh, as a result of having um, large inflated things popping all over the place. I guess you don't have to do it with goat stomachs. You could possibly try it with some flesh coloured balloons. That might be an easier uh, way to do it. Uh, writing on the, the balloon with a pen and then seeing what happens if you deflate the balloon and put that uh, into uh, some kind of uh, flask of oil and see if it disappears. Send in your photos if you get around to doing this. I'd love to see um, how, kind of how it goes. So Julia, thank you very much indeed for for uh, your question. We're going to take a quick uh, break to talk about some of the things that are in the news. Um, so I, we've ju I just tweeted this today because I was very excited to see this coming uh, out and announced by the assistant director of the British School of Athens, where I work often when I'm in Athens, that at the sanctuary of Asclepius, the healing god in Epidaphros, they just discovered a new building um, under a le lower level, so an earlier level, than the later Tholos and Abaton structures. So these are the kind of structures that people would have gone to to sleep overnight in, hopefully being cured of their, um, their illnesses by the gods. And underneath that, there's an earlier a structured building so kind of investigations ongoing that's very very exciting um, but we've also had and I think this is going to be brilliant um, announced lots more announcements about what the new Roman era attraction is going to be in York that's going to open uh, in 2022 they're saying um, so it will be along in time for York Archaeological Trust's 50th anniversary in 2022 and will complement of course the thing that we all go to York for at the moment which is the Yorvik Viking Centre um, and there will be a whole uh, underground Roman world that you will be in, immersed in, the world uh, of, of Roman York. Um, and I think that's going to be absolutely brilliant. So that's to kind of recreating the Roman settlement of Aboricum um, at York, but it will be through sights, sounds, smells, uh, just like uh, the Yorick Viking experience. I think that's going to be brilliant. Um, a Roman coin has been found in northern Norway. Very interesting. So from Sputnik News, Roman coin dates back to the time of Marcus Aurelius. It's the northernmost find of its kind 
signaling that trade contracts in the air, trade contacts in the area uh, may well go back um, much further than, than we expected. Now, this is part of something that I think is a really important new aspect to, to the study of the ancient Mediterranean is thinking about the wider trading networks that the Mediterranean was connected into. Um, and we know that at the time of Marcus Aurelius, uh, kind of the Roman world were going to India, were kind of comfortable, a little bit more comfortable that, down into Africa as well. But we don't often think about them going north through Europe and then across into Scandinavia. So it's absolutely fascinating to see um, in Norway that Roman coins are turning up. And it's not just Roman coins in Norway. Actually, we're seeing amber moving around across that vast scale, um, kind of through the Baltic states and moving backwards and forwards. So we're seeing lots and lots more trade happening across uh, a much, much wider area. And I think it's really interesting that this coin dates to the era of Marcus Aurelius. And famously, in the Chinese sources, it's around about the time of the era of Marcus Aurelius that Roman traders who are kind of mucking around on the east coast of India and into what is now modern day Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, um, they actually get a, or those traders get a, uh, um, an audience with the Chinese emperor claiming to be there on an official, um, a, a, in an official ambassadorial capacity from uh, what the Chinese recall as the Roman emperor Andun, right, kind of which translates slightly over to Marcus Aurelius. Uh, so it's a kind of, obviously this is a key moment in the Roman time. Uh, we talked about the Egyptian mummy, the one that's been stabbed in the back, uh, poor Takabuti over in the Ulster Museum, but there's another one which uh, they've recreated the voice of. Um, so they've, they've done a 3D print of Nesayum's, Nesayum's um, vocal box, and as a result, been able to get it working again, and as a result, kind of, we have a sense of what their voice, what his voice sounded like. Now, I think this sounds... Um, I mean, I mean, that's just staggering, isn't it? That we can actually hear potentially something of the voice of a 3,000 year dead mummy of an Egyptian priest who's living um, 3,000 years ago. Uh, kind of lived under the Pharaoh Ramesses at the 11th, reigning at the beginning of the 11th century BC. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, uh, how we can ever check <laughs> that this is really potentially a little bit like what this person's voice was like, I don't know. Um, but the idea that we can even use the modern technology at our disposal to um, bring back such uh, extraordinarily personal and individual elements of the ancient world, I think it is wonderful to see. Uh, then uh, we've got a time to do what's on, what's on. Uh, so uh, today and tomorrow, if you're near Warwick, our Warwick Classics Drama Festival is on. The performance of Oedipus Rex starts tonight. Few tickets remaining if you want to get in tonight. Come along to the public performance at the Warwick Arts Centre. We'd love to see you there. And then tomorrow we're welcoming well over 500 school kids from across the country um, to come and listen to a day of lectures. I'm going to be talking up there tomorrow as well as another performance of the play. So masses of luck to the cast of Oedipus Rex uh, from Warwick Classics. You guys have got this. Go break a leg. Don't really break a leg, but have uh, have a ball on the main stage of the Warwick Arts Centre. Um, also, Warwick Classics Network, we're doing a new Ask an Academic video. It's Dr. Connor Trainer who will be talking about the Hellenistic world. So if you've got any questions that you want Connor to answer in that public video that will then go live, do email the Warwick Classics Network or and, and in, through the website, which is warwick.ac.uk forward slash WCN. Uh, if you've got a chance on the 27th of January, uh, hang on a sec, so on the 27th of January, running through to the 18th of July. So you've got plenty of opportunity at the British Museum. There are the Gods and Goddesses of Roman Britain Ayat and Atua happening 11.15 to 11.55 a.m. So that sounds like it'd be brilliant um, to go and see. And then the next time I'm down giving a lecture in London is on the 19th of February and I'm going to be talking to the Herculaneum Society about Invisible Herculaneum, linked in a little bit to the Invisible City stuff that I did for the BBC a couple of years ago. So do come along if you can for that. Right, we have got time for one or two more questions. Christian says, it's called Delphi Why It Matters on Curiosity Stream. Ooh, they also have my invisible dog. Okay, well, great. Delphi Why It Matters. Uh, I think it might be the same one then, I think. Uh, but uh, who knows? It kind of, I'll have to go and have a look at Curiosity Stream and, and see uh, what that is. We'll try and post a link or something up on the Facebook page. Um, so we've had a question about, ooh, ah, this one's a really interesting one. Ian, Ian Ekus, I hope I'm pronouncing your surname right from Ian. What's the one historical period you wish you had studied and maybe will? 
Right. So not the ancient Greek and Roman worlds, not the wide ancient worlds uh, of, of, of the Silk Roads, etc. What's the kind of period of time, another period of history that I wish I had studied and maybe will go on to don't day. And I like the fact that it's the maybe will, right? We should always have a goal uh, about something that we want to go and study and find out about. Now, I was thinking about this and for me, I'd be really interested to hear what your thoughts are as well about what period of history you haven't yet had a chance to study, um, but you would like to and maybe one day will. Um, for me, it's probably the 15th or the, you know, the, the latter half of the 15th century through to the early 16th century. So I would love to understand more about this because I think it is a really important period in which the world changed. Rajrupa, you're talking about there's an exhibition coming up in the UAE um, to go and see. Brilliant. Send us some links. Rajrupa, send us some links to the Facebook page or via email and we'll make sure that that is up online on the Facebook page. Um, Fulvio, Fulvio, why was pollution such a problem in ancient Greece? Brilliant. Okay, great question. Great question. Um, but we're going to have to hold that one because we're almost out of time. I want to finish off Ian's question very briefly. Um, so, I mean, 1453, obviously, you've got the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman forces, right? The end of the Byzantine world, the end of the later Roman Empire. Um, but by 1492, you've got Columbus discovering America. Uh, you've also got, uh, kind of in this period, you've got Vasco da Gamba, who is sailing around uh, the, the southern tip of, of, of Africa, the Cape of Good Hope, and making a European to India sailing voyage, which actually had massive implications for the necessity and importance of the land-based silk routes, which had been in full flood back from the 6th century uh, AD onwards through to the 15th century. But now that there was a sailing route to get um, overland to India and to the trading routes of India, then those land routes that went through now um, Ottoman territory coming through across to Constantinople and then over to the Mediterranean started to actually fall into abeyance as a result. So you've got this period of a dynamic shift. You've got that happening in the kind of major east-west divide. You've got that happening in terms of world discovery. You know, this is where the Incas and the Aztecs are at their height. Machu Picchu is being built. You've got the um, pushing back uh, of Islamic influence that had been around in Spain for quite some centuries at this point. But you've got major development of the different caliphates across uh, Africa at this point in time. So you've got a real rebalancing moment and enlarging moment of the map in terms of religion, in terms of trade, in terms of politics, in terms of geopolitical world order. So um, for me, and I would love to get into this period a bit more, um, that would be at the later 15th and early 16th century. Globally, I think absolutely uh, fantastic. And then of course, you know, 15th century is famous in England because it's the 100 years war, it's the war of the roses, it's all of this going on as well. And there's lots of things, really important things going on, but I, li I like and am fascinated by this idea of the complete uh, sort of global rebalancing or changing of balance that goes on, as well as the idea of the world, the, the limits of the world being dramatically expanded all at the same time. We've had a couple more questions come in. Thank you so much for uh, that we will put on the list for next time. Uh, but we are out of time. When is the next time that we are going to be able to have our Q&A? And it is going to be Thursday, the 20th of February. So we've got a little bit of time um, before we can catch up again, but 4 p.m. UK time on Thursday, the 20th of February. I will be here. I hope you will be too. Uh, and we'll be carrying on with some of the questions we haven't had a chance to answer uh, today that you'd sent in. Please do send in more questions. Uh, the, the questions coming in from you guys are the absolute lifeblood of this uh, live Q&A. So it's really, really wonderful to receive them. They can come in through uh, email, michaelscottacademic at gmail.com, or they can come direct to the Facebook page or through Facebook Messenger, do send them in and do, of course, also keep sharing your photos of great places in the Mediterranean and the ancient world that you get to. Keep sharing your stories, any exhibitions that you hear about around the world that you think would be of interest to the community we've gathered here, please, please, please share them and we'll put them online. And of course, also, it's coming to that time of year when I really like doing a few shout outs to amazing teachers uh, around the world. So if you are a school student out there or if you're a teacher yourself and you know other classics teachers or teachers of history more generally that have been really inspiring and have really, really, really made your time at school something extraordinary, then write into me, let me know about their name, let me know kind of what makes that your teacher so extraordinary and we'll do a shout out uh, video congratulations and thanks that you can then pass on to them um, as well. And maybe, maybe we'll be able to sort out a little something at present for them as well. 
Thank you all for taking the time to join. I'm sorry some of you uh, in some countries around the world were having uh, audio issues, um, but let's, uh, let's hope that post-Brexit, um, we will still continue to be the fabulous uh, global community of uh, people interested in the ancient world that we are. All right, have a great rest of your week. Have a lovely, lovely weekend, and I'll see you on the 20th of February. Take care, everyone.